so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for support for systematic reviews, tips, tricks, and best approaches. Um, I want to give you uh, just a few little uh, meeting uh, tasks. Uh, so the first thing is that we are recording. Um, so just in case, uh, just I wanted everybody to be aware that we will be recording this. It will be posted to the call webinars site after the, well, not immediately because it is Easter coming up, but shortly after I will have it up on the website and I will send a message out to everybody who registered for the session. Uh, also, uh, I ask that if you, um, to please mute uh, your, your, your uh, microphones during the session. Uh, and also, if possible, to please uh, turn off your video during the session because we do have folks coming from low bandwidth areas and we want to make sure that they have the best meeting experience possible. I did post, if anybody's having a problem with audio, uh, I did post the call-in numbers in the chat. There is a 1-800 number as well um, in case uh, your audio, your computer audio is not working well. Um, so I'd like to first acknowledge um, being called that Call CBUA represents uh, member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunukudavut, uh, the Inu of Natasinan, uh, the Bialtic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wolostok, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, now with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, uh, excuse me, Leah Boulis, Bo, excuse me, I knew I would do this, uh, Boulis. Uh, is the uh, evidence synthesis coordinator at the Maritime Spore Support Unit. Um, and she has very kindly uh, uh, graced us with her presence today to uh, explain to us more about the systematic reviews and provide some tips, tricks, and best approaches. So I will turn this over to Leah. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's great to, um, to see everyone here. I'm really happy to see how so many people have turned out. Um, it's a really beautiful sunny day here in Halifax. That's where I'm I'm joining from. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk a little bit about systematic reviews. Um, as I said in the description, this is uh, specifically targeted at people who may be new to the systematic review process and supporting systematic reviews. Um, and maybe for people who are a little bit more intermediate, you might pick up a tip or two along the way. Um, I'm going to be covering a whole lot really quickly in this session um, and my slides I will say I tend to make really wordy slides um, but I do that on purpose so that they can be a resource for you moving forward there's lots of links and so Cynthia is going to be posting those on the call webinar um, portal on their web page so that um, you can access them after as well so you can click all those great links and access all of the resources that are available there. So this is what we're going to try to cover today really, really quickly. First, I'm going to talk about what a systematic review is. Then I'm going to highlight some handbooks and reporting guidelines. And then the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about um, is going to be about how information, information professionals should be involved in a systematic review process. And then some tips, tricks, some best approaches, as the title suggested, on how I support reviews and how you can support reviews too. Um, if you see me looking over to my left, it's because I have another uh, screen with the chat open. So if you have any questions uh, during uh, the presentation today, feel free to drop it into the chat. You can also uh, say you want to ask your question uh, using your mic, and that's totally cool too. So either way uh just put it in the chat if you want to have if you want to ask me a question and i will endeavor to answer them so to start i want to talk about what a systematic review is and for this i like to use the definition that is right in the cochrane handbook which is that a systematic review um, they seek to collate evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. They aim to minimize bias by using explicit systematic methods documented in advance with a protocol. So this is actually a really dense and actually really wonderful definition of a systematic review because there's so much in there. They packed a lot into this definition. And I like to use it to kind of approach how information professionals can support systematic reviews. So firstly, 
systematic reviews seek to collate evidence. So the goal is to retrieve as much evidence, published and unpublished, as possible. And this is where most information professionals, um, information specialists, this is where our brains go first. So this is kind of our main gig, is to help design these searches. Um, we are the experts in finding literature, and so we are the ones who are often asked to design the searches for systematic reviews. They use pre-specified eligibility criteria. Um, you, may heard, you may hear this referred to as inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this can actually define the parameters of the search that you design. So this is actually a really important part for you to be involved in and know about is what that eligibility criteria is. And it can actually affect what you end up doing with the search. They answer a specific research question. So as information specialists, we can help define that research question. We're the ones who um, are able to tap into what literature is out there and help identify gaps, help identify if the review has already been done, um, and sort of make sure that it is narrow enough or broad enough to be a good research question. So this is something that we often help with as well. So ideally, a systematic review uses methods to ensure that it's as free of bias as possible. So a systematic review has to measure the risk of bias in the studies that it includes, it includes. And part of minimizing the bias in systematic reviews is by using a protocol to, um, to lay out all of the methods that are going to be used in the, in the review in advance. So they are protocol driven in that authors must state in advance what they plan to do and then follow that plan exactly or um, make changes to that protocol if there are any changes being made. And the search strategy is part of that protocol so um, it's, it's part of what you need to advance before the review team really even gets off the ground when they're still um, conceptualizing what the review is going to look like. You should be involved in that process because the search is often part of what that protocol is, even if it's only in one database. At least one database search, search should be finalized before um, the review really gets going. So in a nutshell, these are the general steps of the systematic review process. It starts with defining and refining the research question, um, and then it's developing that inclusion and exclusion criteria and a plan for data extraction. That's all done in advance as well. So what, what data are we going to be pulling out of these studies? Um, then we come into design and execute the search. And that's when we kind of hand it over to the team and they do the job of screening first the titles and abstracts of articles for inclusion and then the full text of those that get included at that stage. Then you look at the full text of them for inclusion. Once you have a set of full text studies that you've included in the review, you do your data extraction and your critical appraisal. Um, you do synthesis or meta-analysis if that's a uh, part of the review that you're doing. And then finally writing the report. But I actually really like this graphic by Evidence Partners uh, that shows that the systematic review process is actually more of a life cycle. So once the review is done, it's not a, it shouldn't be a static piece of research. Evidence grows and evolves all the time. And so it's generally recommended that for, um, for Cochrane reviews in particular, that they're updated every one to two years, depending on how quickly evidence is being produced on that topic area. And so you may be asked to be brought in to update some of your searches as well. Um, this, of course, didn't happen for probably a year or two after I started working that I was asked to update searches, but um, now more and more I'm getting asked to update those old searches, so that might be part of something that you um, may be asked to do as well. Okay, to get this out of the way, and um, thank you to everyone who sent in um, questions in advance. They really, really helped me shape this presentation. So I hope that I answer most of your questions um, that you asked in advance today. And one of the biggest ones is, what is the difference between a systematic review and a scoping review? And it's, it's one of the most common methodology questions that I get asked all the time. So generally, a rule of thumb, the rules of thumb are that scoping reviews are meant to map out a body of literature. Whereas systematic reviews, they were first developed in health sciences and they are designed to really make recommendations. And they were, they were developed around assessing interventions. So health interventions, do they work or not? And they would take all the evidence around that and come to a conclusion to make a recommendation about whether or not it works. Um, so that's what systematic reviews are designed to do. Whereas scoping reviews, can't do that. You can't make a recommendation um, based on a scoping review. You can only describe. They're really meant to map something out and just give you the lay of the land of a topic area. Um, systematic reviews also must include critical, critical appraisal, whereas in scoping reviews, that's optional. Um, I'd say probably 50-50 of scoping reviews um, 
include critical appraisal as part of the methodology because those who don't include it argue that um, the point of a scoping review is not to assess the literature, it is just to describe what is out there, um, regardless of what the quality is. Now, a really big misconception that I hear all the time is that scoping reviews are actually, they're really not easier. People may think they're easier um, because they see systematic reviews and think it involves a lot of analysis and maybe that's a little bit out of their depth. Um, whereas a scoping review might be easier because it just seems, I don't know, maybe less analysis involved, but they may actually take longer and be more difficult to pull together depending on how broad they are. So I definitely wouldn't take scoping reviews to be easier in any way, than, um, easier than scope, systematic reviews. Um, but when it comes down to it, I would say that your support as an information professional for systematic reviews and, and scoping reviews should look very, very similar because the search for both of those types of reviews will be the same. They both take a systematic, comprehensive approach to searching. So they actually look quite the same from our point of view. Um, it's more for the review team, what they will do with those results. That, that varies depending on if it's a systematic review or a scoping review. I also want to highlight rapid reviews. Those are these are becoming more and more popular, especially with COVID going on. So rapid reviews are an efficient and cost effective alternative to a full systematic review. Um, basically, it's a rapid review is a systematic review with shortcuts, and those shortcuts make it possible to complete it in a very short period of time. Um, they can be published in academic literature, or they can be published more informally. So really most often what you'll see is they're posted on websites um, as, as short reports. And the audience for these tends to be knowledge users and, and policy or decision makers. And again, your, your support for, for a rapid review, if it's a rapid systematic review, should look very similar to a systematic review. It's just going to have a few more shortcuts, like maybe it's fewer databases that you're searching, and you may have to do it a little bit quicker than you would for a systematic review. But really, they, they all look the same from an information and professional's point of view in terms of designing a comprehensive and systematic search. Um, before I move on, I want to highlight some resources for recommending review types. So these are articles that I refer to all the time. And again, these slides will be available, so you'll be able to click through these links and, and read the full text. But um, the first is Meeting the Review Family. So this is an update. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this old classic one. Uh, we called it the Grant and Booth about the 14 different types of, of reviews. So this is an updated version of that, um, whereas before, I think it was 14 that used to be in the old article. Now they're up to 48 different types of reviews, which is just mind blowing. Um, it's crazy that there are 48 different types of reviews. Um, but this article is a really good overview article. Um, um, talking about what different kinds of reviews are out there and what's involved in all of them. Uh, the next one is uh, about different types of systematic reviews. And I will say that this does focus on medical and health sciences literature, um, but it can be really useful. I'm, I, I work in health sciences, um, but I'm sure that it could also be applied to um, subjects outside of health sciences. And so I definitely recommend you taking a look at that. And then uh, the third one there is just about that conversation we just had about systematic reviews or scoping reviews. Um, it's a really good resource about that. And then at the bottom, this is a, a cool tool called What Review is Right for You? And it's a quiz-based decision tool. So you actually do a quiz. You It's a multiple choice. And once you're done making all your selections, it spits out what kind of review it recommends that you should do. So it's kind of a cool quiz-based tool that you can do with clients or send along to clients um, or use on your own to get familiar with different review types. So that's a cool one as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I move on? I know that I'm going through a lot pretty quick. Okay, seeing nothing, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about handbooks and reporting guidelines for these types of reviews. So starting with systematic reviews. Um, the big one, of course, is the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. And part two, chapter four, is the one that really focuses on searching. And so I'm not going to get too deep into, to, <clears throat> excuse me, into Cochrane-specific methodology. Just one moment, I'm just going to take a break. I've been talking a lot of meetings lately, so I apologize if I have to have a cough now and then. Um, so part two, chapter four, focuses on searching. And I'll also highlight that Cochrane offers online training modules and actually has an entire online training course um, about Cochrane methodology. And it's offered on a yearly subscription basis. So you pay for the year and then you have access to all of their training um, for the year. 
Um, and it's actually free for Cochrane authors for one year. So if you're a new Cochrane author, you get access to all the training materials for a year. Um, I've actually never been a Cochrane author, although I am a Cochrane group member. So I'm a member of the Prognosis Methods group. And so I get a discounted yearly rate for that. So if you're ever invited to be part of a group, um, if you're running searches for teams or something like that, um, you can get a discounted yearly rate for their training. Um, the other big, the big name in systematic reviews is the Joanna Briggs Institute or JBI. Um, so this is a this is an organization that's based in Australia. It started in nursing research, I believe, um, and they have their own evidence synthesis manual. Um, it's it's I will say it's quite similar to Cochrane in terms of what the methods are. Like I mean, generally they're very similar. Um, I would say that the JBI manual is more concise. So whereas the Cochrane one is very um, in depth and it gets into lots of issues really deeply. Um, the JBI one is a little bit more concise, and but also broader in that it covers different types of reviews. So they have a whole chapter dedicated to scoping reviews. They have one about qualitative reviews. There's just a whole bunch of different types of reviews that they cover. So just a little bit different. And JBI also offers a multi-day in-person training workshop. And there's actually one coming up in June out of Dow. And actually, I think it's uh, through New Brunswick as well, through St. John. Um, and that's coming up in June. It costs $1,500. Um, and so that one's coming up if you're interested in doing that. I think they're taking registrations right now. And finally, I want to just give a bit of a shout out to the Campbell um, collaboration because they focus on social science research. So the first two, Cochrane and JBI, they, they have their roots in health sciences, but the Campbell collaboration arose out of people wanting to do systematic reviews outside of those topic areas. So they are a collaboration that specific, uh, specifically focuses on social science research. So if you are in that field of research or supporting that field of research, um, they're probably worth checking out as well. Now, full disclosure. I'm going to say that I have actually never taken one of these training courses. Um, I actually am signed up for the JBI course in June though. I'm actually really excited about that. I think it'll be great to have a formal stamp on uh, the things that I do every day all the time. Um, but I will say that you can actually learn a lot on the job. And I know that the price tags on some of these training courses can be quite high. Um, and I would be lying if I said that they were necessary because I've managed to come a long way through learning through um, you know, internships. I did internships at the Kellogg Library, but also um, on the job I do, I go to a lot of webinars and I'm on a lot of mailing lists and I read a lot of literature and, you know, you spend some quality time with the Cochrane Handbook and just, you know, like read through it and that kind of stuff. You can learn a lot on the job. So I want to encourage people um, who may not have the resources to attend these kind of expensive things that you can actually learn a lot without putting a lot of money in. Moving on from methodological guidance, like a handbook, to reporting guidance. So the big one is PRISMA, the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. Um, this link here is to the 2009 version, um, and it's two tools that authors can use together. The first is a checklist, so it lists all the preferred reporting items that a good systematic review should have in their manuscript. And the second is a flow diagram, which visualizes the number of studies that are included at each stage of the review. And both of these things are required by Cochrane and JBI in their reviews. So um, it's kind of been formally adopted as one of those things that is a hallmark of a high quality review is that it follows the PRISMA guidelines. Um, now, often you'll see, erroneously, often you will see in review publications, um, it will say something like, this systematic review is conducted in accordance to PRISMA. Um, that's actually an incorrect way to refer to it. You may say that you followed um, method, methodolo methodological guidance according to Cochrane and that you reported your systematic review according to PRISMA. So PRISMA is really just about how you report and how you write your paper about your systematic review. Um, this is a screenshot of what the Prisma flow diagram looks like. You may be familiar with what this looks like, um, and this should be something that's present. It's a good way to it's a good way to quickly see if the systematic review article that you're reading is high quality or not, as if they have a flow diagram like this in there. However, there are new, yeah, and I knew someone was going to put that in the chat before I got there, just this Monday. Um, and actually, it's been in preprint for a few months, um, but they finally actually published this in the BMJ this week, this Monday, Prisma 2020. It's an updated version, and it has a more in-depth checklist. It's like way longer. <laughs> Maybe not way longer, but quite a bit longer. Um, 
Oh, and yes, James, you have a question about um, including a Prisma diagram and scoping reviews. So yeah, I'm going to get to the scoping review reporting guidelines, but yes, it is also recommended that you have a Prisma flow diagram in the scoping review too. Um, so yes, Prisma 2020 is, is out now, so take a look at that, as well as Prisma S. So Prisma S is, is an extension of the Prisma checklist that is just for searching. So it is awesome. It was developed by a team of librarians over several years. They worked on developing this specific extension of the checklist. And so this is a really, really good in-depth resource about what your search needs to include and how you should um, report and what you need to keep track of, what you need to um, document. Um, so it's a really, really good extension to the Prisma checklist, and there's a link to that there. And this is a preview now. So this is the new Prisma 2020 flow diagram. It is much more in depth than the 2009. <laughs> the 2009 one looks dinky compared to this one now. So um, it, it, it allows for a lot more information to be included. I know that lots of people had issues with the 2009 version with where do we put gray lit searching? Where do we put supplementary search methods? Where do we put search updates? So this tries to account for all of that in a new flow diagram uh, kind of shape. So this, this is the one that will all be getting more familiar with moving forward. And yeah, so scoping reviews, a little bit more about scoping reviews. Um, so there's a great article here. That's the first link, updated methodological guidance for the conduct of scoping reviews. This is another one that came out just this year. Um, it's because the JBI manual updated their guidance for scoping reviews. And so um, that top link is about is the article that describes the changes that are made to chapter 11 of the JBI manual, which is the second link. And uh, there is also a, a specific extension to the Prisma checklist for scoping reviews, which is called Prisma SCR. Um, so that link is to the open access journal article that is um, about the Prisma SCR. And it's a version of Prisma 2009 that was adapted for scoping reviews. So yes, the flow diagram is part of Prisma SCR as well. And I don't know if the team has plans to update it to mirror the, the, the Prisma 2020 update, um, but we'll see, I guess we'll stay tuned. And about rapid reviews, uh, so rapid reviews are definitely not as um, as stringently overseen by an organization as the other review types are, but this is a really good handbook. There's a link that's published by the WHO about rapid reviews. Um, it specifically focuses on how they can um, support health systems, um, but it's just a really good kind of overview document about the different shortcuts you can take in a rapid review. And I also find it really helpful if I'm working on a rapid review to just do some Googling for rapid reviews because the standards are just a lot more fluid and the reviews tend to be more built for purpose so they're really specifically designed for what organization is requesting them. So it can be really helpful to just look at what's out there in terms of rapid reviews. And for reporting rapid reviews, I recommend following whatever Prisma checklist or extension best matches the review method. So if you're doing a rapid review, um, a rapid systematic review, follow a systematic review reporting guideline. If you're doing a rapid scoping review, follow the, the Prisma SCR. So whatever Prisma best matches your, um, your review type, you should use for a rapid review. All right, so that's a crash course in resources related to systematic reviews. And now I'm going to move on to how um, we as information specialists, information professionals should be involved in this systematic review process. Um, this article from 2014 by Melissa Rethlison um, about engaging medical librarians to improve the quality of review articles has been a really a, a touchstone article for me in my career as I've been trying to build what my day-to-day -day job looks like. I refer to it all the time. It really, really lays out really well how information specialists contribute to the systematic review process. And again, a lot of the stuff that I'm sharing today is related to health sciences, but I think it is easily applicable to other fields that are not related to health sciences, and I hope I hope that you find that's true as well. Um, so I'm going to pull out what um, what the authors of this have pulled out as important things that the information specialists can help the review team with. Um, the first is to define the, the search questions, and I add a little note here to also choose review methodology. That is something that I help teams with a lot, and. Uh, and uh, defining the prospective inclusion and exclusion criteria. This should all seem kind of familiar because I, I talked about it a little bit um, earlier. Conducting a preliminary search to further clarify the scope of the question. So maybe the team isn't quite aware of what the body of literature looks like. So you may be doing some preliminary searches to get kind of the lay of the land. Um, choosing data sources, so choosing databases, that kind of thing. Um, 
picking out what the search terms are going to be, helping the team reduce this research question into major concepts that are searchable, developing the search terms and synonyms, using both control, controlled vocabulary and keywords. Um, they have it ordered as you execute the search and then you optimize the output. I like to say to switch these around, you should optimize before you execute. So make sure the search is optimized before you execute the search is, is my advice. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then documenting the search procedure and documenting the search results. Um, I've added a little note here um, at the bottom that your other responsibilities are um, are to deduplicate those search results, so taking out all the duplicates, and possibly helping to write the method section of the report. And if you do that, I highly recommend pursuing authorship on that, um, on that manuscript. So if you have had a hand in writing any portion of a manuscript, you should definitely gun for getting your name on the author list for that manuscript. All right, so now that we know kind of what our roles and responsibilities might look like, here are some of the tips, tricks, and best approaches that I recommend for supporting reviews. So first of all, the consult. So the initial consult, um, it can take place in a meeting or over email, depending on how well you know the client. You know, if, if it's a new client, I definitely tend to recommend having at least one in-person meeting. It can be 30 minutes. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but it can help to break the ice and kind of build trust between you and the team that, you know, you're here to help them and they can, you can, they can rely on you to, to do the search and that kind of thing. So um, at least one initial meeting is probably a good idea. However, if it's a client that you've worked with like tons of times, sometimes I get an email from a client and be like, hey, can you do this? And I'll be like, okay. And then they're like, great and then we just do it. So it depends on how well you know the client. Um, I think of it as an informal interview and not in the way you might think. It's an interview in which you are the employer. <laughs> you are from the kind of the employer side of things. This is your chance to gauge the quality of the project and the team. So I know that in a service oriented, um, oh, somebody has a question here. Okay, Richard, I will get to you in just a second. Um, so, Okay, well, maybe I'll answer it now. So yes, you are right. You don't have to wait until you've contributed to writing before asking for a contributor credit. That's totally fine. All I mean is that if you are right, if you are helping to write, then definitely ask about. But yes, you can certainly discuss co-authorship from the beginning of the process if you intend on being super involved. I think one of the things that I tend to be wary of is discussions about authorship before I know I want to be an author on the paper. And so not all projects are created equal. Um, and as a project evolves, you may find that you don't have the interest or the time to be continue to be a really, really heavily involved in the process. Sometimes it works out that you just want to be a contributor and be acknowledged in the acknowledgements rather than put your name as an author on the paper. So um, I don't always talk about authorship during the first meeting, also because I have a lot of consults and so I, I don't have the time to contribute to be an author on everything that I support. Um, some people may feel differently. Some feel that they do um, want to pursue authorship on everything that they support and that's that's totally okay too. I'd say it's kind of almost a personal decision, but um, yes, co-authorship is definitely something that we should continue to pursue as information professionals. Um, people who are doing the jobs we do deserve to be named as co-authors if they contribute enough to the manuscript. So yes, I am definitely supportive of um, of having those conversations at some point in the process, whether it's really early on or whether it's when you've been supporting a team for a while. Uh, oh yes, and Jackie, good point. It is it it is also dictated by institutional policies. So I should I should say that I am a kind of a strange outlier in that I am working for the health uh, the health authority with within the health authority, and I'm not actually attached to an academic institution. So those kinds of nuances are a little bit outside of the scope of what I do day to day. But if you have questions about um, what institutional policies around authorship. Are, I definitely recommend uh, just chatting with someone who does have that kind of experience in an institution. Okay, thanks for the lively chat box, everybody. I, I really, really appreciate your comments. Um, okay, so back to the initial consults. Um, so yes, these are the kinds of questions that I like to walk out of a consult knowing. Um, and when I was first starting out, I actually had a post-it note in the back of my notebook that I brought to meetings um, that had these kinds of questions <laughs> in them so that I would remember not to walk out without having an answer to some of these questions. Um, and that includes kind of what is the rationale or background behind the project? You know, like how do they come to, um, how do they reach this question? Um, is there a team attached, which I will talk about a little bit? Um, and 
what is the proposed timeline? Can the team provide example articles of what they would include in the review? I'm also going to highlight that a little bit more um, in, in later slides. Has the team done any searching previously? Um, you know, where and what have they searched for that? Can they provide a list of terminology or synonyms? So we are not content experts. We are helping people um, in searches of many, many different topics. And so we are not experts in any of that. So it can be very, very helpful for the team to do some thinking on their behalf about whether or not, um, uh, sorry, about what terms they would like to include um, or see included in the search. And then are there any existing reviews on the same topic. Again, I used to have a post-it note like on my monitor <laughs> reminding me to look to see if there are existing reviews on this topic because um, again, your, your team may not be aware of all the, the literature that's out there and so it can be your job to kind of save them some time. If there is already a review that answers their question, um, then that's great. <laughs> Hopefully that's great. They'll, they'll, they'll see that as encouraging or, you know, if there is an existing review and maybe their methods aren't that great or their search wasn't that great or it's not that, you know, you notice gaps in it, then that could be good rationale for kind of updating that body of work. All right, I'm just taking a look at the chat here. Yes, the ICMJE um, authorship guidelines are really great. Kim has posted that in the chat, so you should definitely check that out. Um, and a minimum of time. So yes, I will get to that, Allison, about the minimum amount of time um, that you say you need to create a search. So I will get to that. All right, so when you say yes, when you should say yes, I'll help. <laughs> um, not all the time, but these are things that are really good. Um, that I like to see in a team that will encourage me to step up and say, yes, I will help you out with your project. Is there a team attached to this project, i.e., is there more than one person? So best practice is that there needs to be at least two reviewers to perform, um, to conduct a high quality systematic review. So if this is just one person, if this is just a student, not so great. Um, and also the proposed review uh, in my opinion, needs to pass the finer test. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what the finer test is on the next slide. Um, the research question should be well-defined or the team should be willing to finesse the question with you. So it can take some back and forth to decide on what a good research question is. Um, and so they should at least be willing to budge a little bit on what that review question might look like. Um, is the timeline appropriate? Um, is the team willing to consider all aspects of the review in advance and or sketch out a protocol. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, systematic reviews are protocol driven. So um, even if you don't want to publish a formal protocol, if the team want to publish a formal protocol, it could be a really good exercise to at least sketch out um, an informal protocol um, so that they are aware of all the steps that need to be taken and everything that needs to be taken into account when doing a review. And then the team should either have a proven track record like they've done them before or if they're experienced, that's OK, but they should be willing to do some training or even self-training either with you or on their own or be willing to do some reading, something like that. Um, they, pe the team should be um, willing to learn more about the systematic review process if they're not familiar with it. Um, the finer criteria. So this is one of my favorite tweets from early in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, which was Every time I see a SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 systematic review, I'm just like, oh God, how do you know? That's a that's a, a GIF from Mean Girls, <laughs> one of my favorite movies. Because at that time, there were so many systematic reviews being produced about COVID-19. Even before like research was getting off the ground, it just seemed like everybody was clamoring all over each other to do work related to COVID-19. And so that relates to um, one of the finer criteria. So the finer criteria, and I apologize, I don't have a citation for this. I see it all over the place. I'm not entirely sure where it originated. It's been passed down to me from many <laughs> information professionals that I know. Um, it is that it is feasible, interesting, novel. So that ties into that that GIF on the right there, um, ethical and relevant. So it's it's good to have these criteria in mind when gauging whether a, a, a review should move forward or how it may need to be nuanced before moving forward. I like to keep these things in mind. All right, so warning signs. Um, this kind of ties into the two, a couple slides ago. So if there's no team attached to the project or just one person, or if it's a student, um, that's a big warning sign. Um, if the research question is not well-defined and the team's not willing to negotiate on it, it's too broad, if it's too narrow, that's a warning sign. If the proposed review isn't novel, so if it's been done before and there seems to be no indication of why this is different from the one that's been done before, um, that's a red flag. If the timeline is too short, if the team doesn't have a protocol in place or doesn't want to create one, doesn't want to think ahead, um, and if the team's inexperienced or uninterested in training, 
Um, those are all kind of warning signs for me in whether to uh, move ahead with supporting a review. And that's when I would kind of push back a little bit about, um, you know, what the team can do to sort of uh, work on their own before coming to me for help. Um, how to combat warning signs. So if there is no team or only one person, uh, I always like to point to best practice. So again, Cochrane and JBI are very, very clear about the number of uh, people who should be on a team, and that's definitely more than one, <laughs> more than one person. Um, if a question is too broad or narrow, sometimes what I'll do is I'll run example searches, and I will actually show the team the differences in recall. So if we did this really, really broad question, it's going to bring in thousands and thousands and thousands of results. Is that something that is good, that seems like an okay idea to you? Like kind of going back and forth with that, or like saying this question's way too narrow, you're only getting a few results. Um, that kind of work can really help to clarify to the team. Um, how their question maps out onto the literature. If the proposed project isn't novel, you can think of novel ways to reframe the question. So maybe um, they come to you with initial search question, um, you do some digging, you find out that there's already kind of a review about it, but it doesn't cover this particular angle. Those kinds of um, exercises are really good to try to make sure that the review project is novel as possible. The timeline's too short. I have a couple of slides that you can share, um, which I'll show you in a second. If there's no protocol, again, kind of point to best practice. You don't have to publish a protocol, but it's really good to sketch out a plan for your review in advance. And if there's an inexperienced team, what I will say is offer training, but I, I, I want to encourage people not to fall into a trap that can kind of happen sometimes. Um, if you have a really inexperienced team, it can become into a situation where they're, they're calling you all the time, they're always in your office or on Zoom with you, you know, that you're, you're emailing them, they're taking up like tons and tons of your time. Um, I would just advise to be careful about over engaging um, if you feel like you don't have the time and capacity. I know that a lot of us have lots on our plate already. And so it can be really tempting to want to go with a team, you know, it's like you feel really great about it, you're going with them on this ride, this learning journey, you want to walk them through the process. And sometimes that's okay. Um, sometimes that's something that is really great to do. And sometimes it's too much. And so I would just kind of advise that not to overengage too much if you want to stop from burning out and, and helping too many inexperienced teams all the way through the review process. Um, these are a couple of really great slides from my colleague, Dr. Jill Hayden. They're quite uh, dated now. They're from 2013. Um, but this is the time required for a systematic review that she took for an article from JAMA in 1999. And a minimum of six months, they say, is needed for a systematic review. And I would say that most systematic review projects that I know of are really are more among like the one to two year timeline. Now, this, of course, is changing. It's changing because of COVID-19 and people want to do things a lot quicker. Um, I'm a little bit afraid of this culture of rapid research and what implications that's going to have for research moving forward. Like it's going to be, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how people manage their expectations again, kind of reeling it back from a crisis situation. But in normal times and non-pandemic times, I, um, we say at least six months is needed for a high quality systematic review. And you can see how that's broken down here on the slide. Um, and then to Allison's question, which you had in the chat box earlier about how um, how long you need to create a search. So in this slide, Jill says um, about 40 hours to develop and about eight hours to implement. I think this is a really high ballpark. Um, I usually budget about 10 to 15 hours just for the search portion. So going back and forth with the team, dividing, um, designing the search and then running that search and, and deduplicating it and packaging it. So I budget about 10 to 15 hours for that. Now that may be larger if you're just starting out. Um, I definitely would say that it's probably going to be somewhere in between 10 hours and, and 40 hours, but I wouldn't budget 40 hours like all the time. Um, and if you are, again, if you are an author on the project, if you're going to be involved in more than just designing the search and passing it along, then um, it's a little bit more difficult to quantify. And so it may approach a higher hour uh, number of hours. You can see here that Jill also has some um, some estimates for how long it takes to screen articles. Um, and so that can be useful if a team um, needs some advice on how long, how much time to budget for that kind of stuff. All right, things that we typically don't do. I love this meme. I can't pass up an opportunity to share a meatloaf meme. Um, so uh, we typically don't screen articles for inclusion. This is something that you want to encourage the review team to do. 
they are the content experts. Um, so they are the ones who are going to want to have eyeballs on whatever you are saying yes or no to in the review. You are not the content expert. And so really, it shouldn't be your, um, it shouldn't be left to you to help screen those articles, um, as well as pulling full text articles. So often you'll have people be like, okay, so we have like 100 articles for full text screening. Can you just pull those <laughs> and pop them into Covenants for us? So I always say no to that. It is a copy, copyright quagmire that I'm not even going to get into to do that. Um, what I often recommend people do is to use the DOIs attached to an article and actually just visit them online. <laughs> do it that way. If you can get them to log in to your um, to your library website so that it's it's you know you're logged in and then they can actually go in online and look at the articles that way. Uh, that's an easier way and less time intensive way because you don't have to pull all these PDFs into a, a citation manager and it's just like a mess. So I definitely recommend against doing um, pulling full text unless there's like really tricky ones, which to be fair happens sometimes. Um, so definitely help out with those ones, but I, I would not say yes to pulling all the full texts. Um, and also we don't typically do data extraction. So I will occasionally help with data extraction forms. Um, this is something that I've started to do more recently as I've been more involved in reviews, um, but I don't actually tend to help with the actual data extraction. Okay, designing the search. Searching is an art. Searching is my favorite part. Um, it takes trial and error and you will improve over time if you are just starting with systematic searches. I look back at my old searches and it's like, oh, it's like looking back at old high school photos. Sometimes you do searches and you have regrets and that happens. But um, I love Ms. Frizzle. Um, take chances, make mistakes, get messy. That's the kind of thing you have to do when you're designing a search, especially when you're first starting out. Um, my first tip, my like number one tip is to ask your client for a list of example articles. So this is something that I ask every single team that I help. If they have one or two or five to 10 even, um, articles that they know that if they were doing a review that they would include, they would definitely include them. And so this helps you to learn what terminology should be used, what the appropriate keywords would be, what controlled vocabulary is being used, and you can use it as a gold standard to test if your search is finding all of those things. So if, you, if the team wants to include those articles, then your search should find all those articles. Um, I have a little box here about how to use a gold standard. Um, basically, you want to create a search somehow, whether it's a string of IDs, that's what you can do in a, in a database like PubMed, or it could be a string of titles if, if the database um, searches well by title, just some search that finds that exact number of articles. And then you can pair it with your search um, using and, and see how many get brought up. And if you want to see what doesn't get brought up, you can use not. So I do that all the time when I'm designing a systematic search. Um, I use a gold standard. And I just want to highlight the Yale Mesh Analyzer. This is for people who are working specifically in health sciences. Um, uh, in working in PubMed or Medline, this actually, you put in a string of PMIDs and it spits out a table that compares all the different mesh terms or controlled vocabulary terms that are used by all those articles. Really, really useful. Tip two is to use a search table to build your search. And this may be something that you advise if you do any training on searching, this might be something that you already advise that your students do. Um, so this is an example one that I did for a question about pharmacological therapies for neonatal abstinence syndrome. And this is one that I designed in Ovid Medline. Um, so you can see here that I have columns for all the different concepts and I have rows for controlled vocabulary and for keywords. And you can see that the neonatal abstinence syndrome concept actually spans two of my concepts. So I divided neonatal and I divided in abstinence, um, but that that mesh term actually bridges both of those things. So how that maps, how that ends up mapping out onto the search looks like this. Um, so because there is one mesh term that bridges the two concepts, um, you have to kind of combine it in a kind of a strange way. And I also decided that I wanted those concepts to appear close to one another in the record. So I used adjacency searching. You can see in line seven there. Again, these slides are going to be available after this. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into this search right now, but this is just a portion of a search that was um, that was published in a, in a paper that, of a systematic, systematic review that I supported. OK. A big million dollar question is how many results are too many? I don't know how many are too many or too few. So there's really no easy answer to this question. It's going to vary depending on the topic. Um, so rather than focus on just like the pure number of results, what I like to do is try to assess the frequency of relevant results. So 
switch off the best match or top results function of whatever database you're searching and try sorting it by date or by author, something that is just kind of more random and take a skim through the results and try to gauge how many relevant results are appearing um, in the first few pages. It should give you a fairly good sense of how sensitive or specific your search is. If you're not comfortable doing that, then you can send a selection of articles along to your team and get them to do a preliminary screen and say like, how many of these are hitting the mark? Is there anything on the mark here? Is it not? So rather than just looking at numbers, Numbers, I find that's a better way to gauge whether a search is being affected. Um, generally in health sciences, um, if there are fewer than 100 results, uh, the body literature might be too small. And if there are like over 5,000 results just in one database, that could be a sign that your question is a little bit too broad. Um, but again, it, it varies so widely. Um, I would focus a little bit more on um, relevancy and, and that kind of thing rather than if like how big your search is and ultimately really it is up to the team how much they feel like screening some teams are really gung-ho and they're like i'll screen ten thousand, and that's fine <laughs> you know like that's their prerogative if they would rather really feel like there's no stone unturned but i will say that most reviews i support tend to be around between let's say 2000 and 8000 results um, is the range of reviews that i tend to support um finalizing the search so work in one database to start when you think you've nailed down a good search Send it to the team to look at it. Um, they might notice you've missed some things, which could be really good. They also might be wrong. I want to point out that sometimes teams will be like, well, why didn't you include that? I want to encourage you to stand your ground. If you didn't include something because it didn't make sense, um, you know, if you, uh, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but I would avoid putting terms related to outcomes in your search because it limits your search to things that mention outcomes specifically in the abstract. Maybe it might not be mentioned until deep down into the full text of the article. So including outcomes can actually um, narrow your search too much. So often teams will be like, well, why aren't the outcomes in there? So stand your ground, explain that. Um, explain why those things aren't there. And now is also a good time to have your search peer reviewed. So after you finalize the search in one database, um, I really recommend using a peer review of electronic search strategy statement and checklist. It's called PRESS. It was designed by information professionals for information professionals. It's recommended by JBI and Cochrane. It can seem intimidating. You know, you're kind of putting yourself out there. There's a really great community of searches in Atlanta, Canada. Um, we help each other out with PRESS all the time. And so if you want to dip your toes into that, um, you know, email me, <laughs> you know, if you if you if you're looking for somebody to, to peer review search, if I can't do it, there's a community of us who would love to to help out and, and peer review your searches. So translating the search, I like to use Excel for this. So once you finalize it in one database, it's time to translate it to the other databases. I like to use Excel because it allows me to line up each row in the search and I can compare them across um, the different databases that way. Um, I would really recommend getting familiar with database syntax. So this is an example of a search syntax table that I've built. There's a link to a similar one that's on the Dow Library's website. Um, I would recommend making your own if you want with the databases you use most. It just compares the different ways that the databases denote field tags or truncation or wildcards, all that kind of stuff. It can be really handy to have like a, a resource that you, if this was, if this was the real world, it would be posted on my pin board in my office, which I haven't been to in a year. Um, so anyway, um, it's good to have a resource like this kicking around. Uh, oh, Cynthia asked if there's a listserv for this community in Atlanta, Canada. Well, um, so there is a listserv for the Maritime Health Libraries Association. So a lot of us working in systematic reviews um, in the Maritimes are health sciences librarians. So that's kind of where most of the activity is for that. However, I do know that there is interest, um, interest from people from outside the health sciences. So. I don't know if there's room for up uh, to build a bit of a kind of evidence synthesis community um, in Atlanta, Canada. Maybe this is something that we could, we should talk about or something. I'll leave that for after this presentation. But um, if you are in health sciences, uh, I definitely recommend checking out MHLA. I definitely I see some of our board members posting in the chat <laughs> some links to uh, to MHLA. So definitely check that out. All right, tip five, keep the receipts, track everything, keep a running document with all of these details, your, your questions, your limitations, your database details, search tables, search histories, the names of your saved searches that you save in the databases, um, any citations or links to search filters or other searches you use for inspiration, anything else that's required by the Prisma S, keep 
um, keep a document with all this stuff. Um, these are some very terrible, I'm sorry about that, very terrible screenshots of my templates that I use for this. But this is a, it's just kind of an example of a tracking form that I use to track my search on the left and then to package um, results for clients on the right. This is how I tend to put them together to send. And you'll see that I have the Prisma S checklist items like right in that document so that when the team goes to write the manuscript or when I go to write the manuscript, like it is right there and all the answers to it are right there in that document. So once you finish translating searches to all the databases, I try to execute all the searches in one day. So, um, so you can take many days to do the translating and all that stuff. You may be working in databases, but then when it's time, when it's go time, when you're done, I recommend I recommend trying to do it all in one day. Um, and I tend to use Covenants to deduplicate. I used to use EndNote to deduplicate. Sometimes I still do that. There was a bit of mistrust about Covenants. Um, if it's doing a good job of deduplicating, I found that it's pretty good. So I've actually been using it more and more to deduplicate. Um, and I always save the citation files from each database. So I don't recommend using any of the direct export functions. You wanna have a record of those citations at that moment in time. So definitely do the option where you download um, usually an RIS file of that citation file from that day. Um, I will get to the questions after this because I'm running short on time and I want to make sure I get through everything. Um, so Covenants and Rayan are great for screening. So before the session, I had a lot of questions about Covenants. Um, I wish I could do more of a dem demo on Covenants. I just don't have time today. Um, but it is the screening tool that's recommended by Cochrane. It has a demo mode. So you can use the demo mode to familiarize yourself with it. It's really intuitive. Like I, it's really straightforward. I call it, it's like a dating app for reviews. It's, it's just like, yes, no, yes, no for everything. It just kind of goes really easily. It's a really, really good program. However, it does cost money. So Rayan is a free tool that performs similar functions. Now I will say I have little experience using Rayan. Maybe some others um, in the session today have a bit more experience with it, but it is free and they've recently updated their interface. So it looks a little bit nicer. Um, so yeah, definitely worth checking out Rayan. You can also use really any reference manager to do screening. It may not be as fancy looking, but um, you can use EndNote or Zotero or Mendeley to screen. You can even use good old Excel. It's what people used for years. Um, if you were using Zotero to do screening, um, ideally, again, it should be done separately by two reviewers and you can kind of resolve them by consensus or by a third reviewer. Um, but this is a kind of example of a, of a folder structure that I would use in Zotero. So you'd have all your results in the first one, then you sort it into included, excluded as you go, then move those on to full text and you'd sort it and to include it and exclude it as you go. You have to you have to um, note the reasons for inclusion at full text, and then you have your included studies at the end. Okay, tips to save time. So I always look to other high quality reviews for search inspiration. Just always be sure to cite their work or even to contact the author. If you plan on using a large portion of their search, like get in contact with them and say, hey, like we're working on a similar review, wondering how you would feel about me using parts of your search. Always cite that, but that can save time. You know, there are lots of reviews out there and chances are a team has worked on at least a part of a similar search that you have. Looking in Cochrane, uh, in the Cochrane library is really good for this. Um, if you frequently work in the same topic areas, save the searches as separate concepts and save search filters that you use often as different co uh, concepts. And then these are kind of Lego bricks that you could use to build a Lego castle later on if you're developing a, a bigger search strategy later. Um, so save, having like a list of these saved in databases saves a lot of time. And as I said before, I develop a set of templates or documents you use often. Cynthia asked if I was open to sharing my template. Uh, I think so. Let me chat with the people at MSSU, but I think that that's probably fine. I can probably share those with you um, after the presentation. Um, and finally, a systematic search doesn't stop with electronic databases. You can also support the team with gray lit searching, backward and reference searching. So looking backwards through reference lists, forward searching, so seeing where included studies have been subsequently cited. All those things are things that you can help with. With gray lit searching, I would um, say that you can help design the searches, but I always recommend that the team actually executes those searches because gray lit searching, um, whether it's in Google or in websites, that's actually a form of screening. You are making judgments looking right at, you can't take Google results and put them into confidence. You actually have to be in Google looking at them. And so that's actually screening. So what I'll do is de design the searches for them, but then they go ahead and execute those. And then you send the team off into the sunset. You've helped them with their research question. You've worked with them to design the search. 
you finalized and translated the search, you've exported and deduplicated the results. Um, if you did your deduplicating in Covidence, you can invite the team to Covidence, or you can send them an RAS file of their results to use the, the citation manager of their choice, and then it's up to them. Unless uh, you want to offer more methodological advice or help them write the method section, as we talked about before. Phew, okay, I just covered a lot of stuff. These are some questions that I um, wanted to highlight again that people sent me in advance. Um, there were some questions about systematic reviews in the social sciences. So yes, Campbell supports those. Um, how do you deal with students whose profs assign systematic reviews in one term? I had great conversations with Jackie Finney and Louise Gillis and Melissa Helwig, all at Dow Libraries, about having conversations with faculty. This isn't something that I do a whole lot. Again, I don't work in an academic institution with students, but have conversations with faculty, refer to best practice, you know, remind them that not all literatures need to, literature reviews need to be systematic reviews. They can be systematic-esque, but they don't have to use the systematic review label. And I've linked here to a really good um, paper about how narrative reviews still have a place in research. It doesn't always have to be a systematic review. And what if your institution doesn't subscribe to a lot of databases? This is another question that I got. So systematic reviews don't necessarily need to search for like every database under the sun. You can take advantage of a lot of free databases. PubMed is free. You can get really good at using Google Scholar. You can partner with someone else in the information community that may have access to the databases. So again, that kind of community building thing that I was talking about before, um, all really good ideas. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing, oh yeah, Cochrane. Cochrane's available to everyone. Thank you, Cynthia, for highlighting that. So yes, everyone has uh, availability, um, uh, can access Cochrane in Atlantic Canada. Um, if you want to learn more about systematic reviews, that JBI training course that I mentioned earlier is coming up. There's some YHEC training courses coming up that I've seen. Those cost a bit of money, but you can always check them out. There's an awesome book by Margaret Foster, specifically for librarians, about systematic reviews. And there's also um, an associated webinar recordings that are free. So check those out as well. Those are really good resources. Phew, I made it. I made it to 257. Not very much time for questions, unfortunately, although um, I don't know if people can stay up a little bit later to have questions, but I'm going to stop talking now and see if people have questions. I, I see Richard had a thought. Um, let me see here. Thoughts about how you respond to queries about searching a discovery layer versus subject specific databases. OK, so again, I don't work in uh, an institution that has a discovery layer and I support people from all different kinds of institutions. So I absolutely definitely recommend going to the source, going to the databases themselves and not using a discovery layer. Um, that's what I would recommend about that. Uh, uh, Jackie? Jackie? Yes, Jackie. Hi, that was great, thank you. Um, I have a question about critical appraisal. So it's one area that I feel kind of self-conscious in when talking to people about because I'm definitely not an expert in it. So can you just very briefly speak to how you handle it when people ask you for advice on how they do it and where they <laughs> should go for information? Yeah, I mean, so this is something that I need to do some learning in as well about um, critical appraisal. So yeah, it's not something that we are trained to do. So I, I refer them. So JBI has lots of great resources about critical appraisal that I will often say, like, check out JBI and the Cochrane um, handbook does as well. You know, again, it's kind of like, look for similar reviews and see what critical appraisal tools they've used. I do a lot of relying on what other people have done and looking at high quality things that other people have done. That's something that I like to do a lot. Um, but yeah, there's not really like a, a blanket answer that I tend to give. It's kind of just like working in what their topic area is, seeing what similar reviews are doing, seeing what JBI is saying, that kind of stuff. But it's definitely something that I want to learn more about. The critical appraisal is like the final frontier for me. <laughs> Oh, and Allison says that uh, she refers people to JAMA Evidence. Awesome. Really good worksheets. Thanks, Allison. And Duke. I've heard of Duke as well. Uh, okay. Does anybody else have questions? And please feel free to unmute uh, to ask your question. You don't have to just do it in the chat. Okay, I think we're, I think we are finished with the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Leah. This has been fantastic. Uh, the uh, there's just so much information to to, to <laughs> figure out there, but um, but 
as I said to everybody before, this will all be uh, this was recorded and it will be posted to the call webinars page along with Leia's slides. And also, uh, I tend to capture the chat log as well, at least the pertinent like question and answers that were put there. Uh, just so folks have that to see as well. So that I will send a message out to all the registrants. Everybody who registered for the session will get an email to tell you uh, when those are available and where to go to get them. And everything, all of our webinars are freely available on the call website. And it's not just for members. Uh, but I want to thank you, Leah. Uh, this has been fantastic. We may we may talk about subsequent sessions on <laughs> things that may need a little bit more depth. Uh, but uh, but this has been fantastic uh, introduction to this area for all of us. Um, thank you so much. And yeah. everybody have a great Easter. Yeah, everybody have a great Easter.